So hey everyone, it is March 31st and today is World Backup Day. I just saw this somewhere and um, thought I would dust this presentation off because um, we're gonna talk about data backup strategies. And as photographers, we're kind of special in that we have a ton of data to back up, namely our most important photos. Uh, and those can be your pictures from your trips, your family photos, everything. So it's really important to have a good backup strategy. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and I hope you enjoy what I've put together. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. And I want to bring up backup strategies for photographers. Again, I'm Jason O'Dell, and you can find me online at luminescentphoto.com. So this is what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I'll try to keep it um, as minimally technical as, as, as possible, but I wanna talk about, you know, kind of the no brainer stuff, why it's important to back up your data, um, how to protect your photos and everything else. And also at the end, I'll talk a little bit about backing up your Lightroom catalog, because um, a lot of us do use Lightroom and it's a little different there. So the thing about losing something, um, it's just really a matter of when, not if. Um, and that could be from any number of reasons, um, including you could have a hard drive die. This happens um, eventually over time. Um, they all eventually fail. Some are better than others, but um, it's it's a real problem. Um, it's a it's not something that happens frequently, but when it does happen, it can really freak you out. Um, you might have a warranty on your on your hard drive uh, that replaces the drive, but not what's on it. So just be aware of that. Um, but there's other things you could accidentally delete files. I've done this. I've accidentally deleted things, dragged it to the trash when I didn't think I was doing that. And then you go uh, a week later, oh my gosh, where did those pictures go? Where did those files go? Um, so that's a big whoops. Um, and then of course, what we hope never happens, but that's catastrophic uh, failure. That's, that's like if there's a natural disaster of some kind, a tornado, a fire, flood, whatever, excuse me, um, that um, wipes out your potentially wipes out your house. We don't want that to happen either. So these are all reasons to protect our data. How do you do it? Okay, so this is a good question. Um, I'm gonna talk about a few different methods. One is called data partitioning. I'll talk about making regular backups. I'll talk about how you can protect yourself against a drive failure, um, and then how to be prepared for an emergency. Okay, so all of these are important. Some of them go together. Some of them are a little bit more technical than others. You don't have to do everything, but um, they're all part of a good cohesive data protection strategy. So the first strategy, and this one's pretty easy, is simply called data partitioning. And what that means is that you're just not putting everything onto one hard drive, okay? Um, this is getting more and more commonplace, especially if you have a computer that might have a small built-in drive and no, no internal expansions. Once upon a time, I remember, you know, you would just get a giant hard drive and everything was on it, your, your boot data, your system, and, and everything else. But if you can put your data, including documents, your photos, other things like that, on a separate drive, like an external drive or an internal drive bay or whatever, um, then you don't lose everything if there if there's a drive failure it's never good to have a drive failure but let's just say your system drive crapped out you know it, it dies uh your data would still be intact so you could put in a new drive restore your operating system that's usually pretty easy to do these days with you know downloadable files that kind of thing and your data are still there or if it's on an external drive you could connect that external drive to a, a backup computer like a laptop until you get your other computer back online okay so that's that's just one way of protecting your data from a drive failure just put it on different disks and again, if you use external drives, like in an enclosure, a little, little, um, little portable drive, then um, you can take that drive with you in case there's an emergency or if you want to connect it to a different computer. So that's a nice, nice strategy as well. So this is what data partitioning looks like. This is just the, um, the uh, a screenshot of what my computer looks like. And, and I've got a bunch of different volumes, but my internal drive, I'm running a Mac Studio. Uh, the the built-in drive is like a terabyte drive, and that's my boot disk. 
And then I've got a couple of different drives for data. You can see there's icons showing that these are actually in enclosures. I have a separate disk for my Lightroom catalog. It's a little solid state external drive. I could take it with me if I needed to. And then um, my time machine drive, which I'll talk about a little bit later. That's a Mac uh, thing, but uh, it's, it's a part of my backup strategy. So again, I've got my boot drive that has all of my application software and then my data drives or drives that have all of my documents. Now, just putting your, your data on different uh, drives is nice, but it doesn't protect you from if, if one of those drives were to, were to die um, or, or to fail. So it's really important to include a regular backup plan for your data and your, your computer. Uh, and there's different types of backups um, and different and and how you back things up um, will depend on you know where you store them and where they go and and how you retrieve them. So I'll talk about the types of backups, where you can store them, and how to do it. Starting with the the types of ways you can back up your computer. Okay, um, you could do a full backup, and that just completely writes a complete backup of all of your data at any particular point in time. Um, this is probably the most time consuming method. Uh, it is a snapshot in time, but it would be, you know, where you regularly just copy everything over to another disk. Um, but there's another kind of backup called an incremental backup, and I think they're more useful. These are regular backups that include a database, and it just logs the changed files. So if you haven't changed a file in a month or two, when it goes to run the backup routine, it's only writing in the, um, the, the, the newer files. And that's, that's faster. And some of these tools allow you to have version histories where you can actually go back and recover uh, earlier versions of files that were either changed or deleted by whatever mechanism. And so this is a thing in an incremental backup with a database that protects you from yourself. And believe me, I've done this uh, more times than I care to admit, where you've accidentally deleted something, whether it's an email message or a photo or whatever, you can go back and recover that. Now, whether it's a complete full backup or an incremental backup, there's different ways to store it. Okay. Um, the first is called a local backup. Now, this is where you copy everything over using a, a backup utility software to a external drive or an internal drive or whatever um, that you have physically in your house or in your office, wherever. That's called local. Um, the benefit of this is that if you need to recover something, it's right there. You have this drive, you just connect it to your computer, and you run the recovery routine. The, the downside of this um, is really uh, twofold. First of all, if, if your house burns down, you're, you're buggered. That's, that's not a thing we wish on anyone, but, but you would lose your backups too. So if your backup is in the same place, physical location as your main computer, and there's something happens to your home where you have to, have to leave. The other thing too is that if you've got a lot of data, for example, my, my data drive is something like I've got 14 terabytes worth of junk on there, including all my pictures and everything, data documents, whatnot. You have to have a backup drive that's big enough to hold everything uh, in, in your computer, okay? Um, so you can get a bigger and bigger hard drives. And usually you want a little extra room on that drive if you're going to have that database with, say, the incremental backup so you can have that version history. And that adds up over time. You know, you start running into situations where you're going to have to have oh gosh, I need another 16, 20 terabytes of drives. And that, that adds up over time. You can also do an offsite backup, okay? And there's different ways of doing this. Um, the benefit of an offsite backup is that you're storing your data separately from your main computer. Um, some people have done this in the past where they make backups and then they take a copy and they give it to their parents or they they put it in a safe deposit box or in a safe somewhere in, in someone else's home the ultimate in data protection because it's nowhere near your computer right um that's a little extreme and a better option these days is using a cloud backup uh, tool and i'll talk about that in a little bit the benefits of an off-site backup though no matter what kind you use is that it's secure from a catastrophic failure 
Uh, it takes longer, though, if you need to do the backup, right? You've either got to go and get that drive from whomever has it, or you've got to get download files from, from a cloud service. Uh, it takes a little longer, but it's not the end of the world. So what are the backup tools that you can use? Well, if you're on a Mac, there's a built-in backup tool called Time Machine. And it's really easy and it does automated incremental backups. So it just runs and it just stores everything. You need to run it on a, a separate disk than your computers. So you would attach like a little external drive and usually pops up and says, do you wanna use this for your time machine backup? Um, the nice thing about it is that it allows you to go back in history, you know, back in time and recover files that were either changed or deleted. So let's say you just did something stupid like you accidentally saved over something after changing it instead of saving it with a unique name, right? You save the file instead of save as. Easy mistake to make. Well, I can go back into Time Machine, just pull that down and say, give me, give me the previous version from the last saved state. Now, this is useful, but it's most useful for things like what's on your system disk, your boot drive, your email, your music, your applications, and any locally stored documents. Where it gets messy is if you've got large numbers of files, huge numbers of files, because then again, you need a disk big enough to hold all this stuff, okay? There's another backup tool you can use to back up everything. Uh, there's a program, there's a, several of these out there, but the one I've used in the past is called Carbon Copy Cloner. And this literally can do incremental backups to other drives. So you connect a drive to your computer, it detects it, says, okay, run the backup routine. And you can configure these to run automatically on a schedule. Um, and it's good for data archives. And it's, you can get this software at the, the website called bombitch.com. Okay. Um, I haven't used it in a long time, but it's something I have used in the past. This is a more traditional backup with it, where it just copies new files every single time it looks for changes and you literally have a disk as a backup okay so not quite as convenient as time machine but uh, it also works for large files if you're on a pc using windows um, there's the windows file history they kind of hide it in there um, but you can use file history to create incremental backups of folders that you select. And you would just say, go to. And at default, it backs up to your C drive on your user folder and your account name. Um, they kind of hide it these days, I've heard, because Windows wants you to use their, uh, or Microsoft, I should say, wants you to use their OneDrive solution, which is a cloud storage that you have to pay for. Um, that's probably fine for people who have small amounts of, of, of data, you know, um, you know, maybe a, you know, a couple hundred gigabytes, you know, a terabyte or less, no big deal. But if you're a photographer and you've got a tremendous number of files, um, that could get expensive depending on their plans. Um, there's also the Windows Backup and Restore tool. It complete, creates a complete system image. And that's where you want to back up your entire disk or system files in case of a drive failure. I'm not sure if it does the incremental backup tool. Um, but it would be a backup routine that you could manually run with another drive attached to your to your machine. And if you want some info on this, um, I just found a link. There's you can just do a quick Google search for how to create the file history backup in Windows 11 because it's changed a little bit since uh, Windows 10. Now, cloud backups are something that have been around for a, a while but are gaining popularity now. And it's the tool that I rely on the most as a photographer. Because a cloud backup is what it's really doing. There's no, there's no clouds here. It stores your data on a bunch of different disks across a lot of disks at multiple offsite locations that are connected by the internet. That's the, the cloud, if you will. This is sort of, it's, Maybe not the best, but it's pretty close to the best solution for photographers because, first of all, it's going to protect your data in case something happens to your computer at home. You know, tornado hits and everything is destroyed. Um, your data are safe in the cloud. Um, but it does require a, a decent internet connection. You've got to upload everything that you have. And if you've got, you know, terabytes worth of data, you can imagine that if you're on dial up internet, this probably isn't going to work. Um, it's going to take forever. Um, I started using a, a, cloud backup 
uh, solution probably over 10 years ago now, about 10 years ago, I think. Um, and the initial backup actually took a couple of weeks, I think, to do. And that was because most home internet services, they give you a fast download, but fairly slow upload. Once that's done, though, the additional backups are incremental. So it's only writing changed files or, or, or new files, and that goes much, much quicker. Now, if you want to restore your files from a cloud backup, there's a couple ways to do it. Depends on the provider. Some for smaller files, they can they can just go through and process. You tell it which folders or which files you want to retrieve uh, using an online uh, browser, and and you can just download a zip archive of the of the recovered files. If it gets really big, you know, you need to recover maybe a terabyte or two terabytes or something like that, then what they'll do is they can send you your files on an external, usually a USB drive. Um, and then you get that drive, you copy it over, it's encrypted, you copy it over to your computer, you restore it. And then usually what they do is if you send them the drive back, they refund your money. And if not, you can pay $120 or whatever it costs, and you can keep the drive as an external backup should you so choose. And I've done this. I've actually done this where they where I lost some video files they were monster video files and uh, i recovered them uh they sent me a drive and i copied everything over and then i just mailed the drive back and i wasn't charged a nickel so it was it was pretty great the only downside of this is time it takes longer so i'm using a a, a product called backblaze there's other ones too there was a carbonite i think was another one but backblaze is super easy it runs right through my operating system. And I just tell it what, what to back up. Um, and then you can see over on the right-hand side, if you do want to restore something, you can um, just use either a web download. Um, and that you know can be time consuming if you don't have fast internet, or you can get a flash drive or even a USB drive and they send it FedEx. So it, it works pretty well. Okay, so those are backup strategies and those are important and part of the reason we want to back up the data like i said it's kind of three three things that can go wrong right uh you you can have an accidental deletion you can have a hard drive die or there can be a catastrophic event that wipes out your computer so what about how do you protect yourself against a drive failing? Well, you know, the backup is the first part. Now, I'm going to admit that what I'm going to talk about here is a little bit more advanced, a little more esoteric, and probably not for everybody, okay? This is sort of a combination of building some, some redundancy into your system along with some backups, okay? So it is not if, but it is when a hard drive will, will die. I'm talking mostly about spinning hard drives, but all drives can have a problem that can cause them to fail. And if that happens, you're out of luck. You just can't get your data. And I've already mentioned regular backups. Regular backups protect you, okay? They, they absolutely protect you, and they are the absolute first line of defense against a drive failure. You've got your data somewhere else. You can just get a new drive, copy it over, and recover it. But what about a little fancier way of, of having something so that you can continue to use your, your data and access it if a drive fails? Well, how does that happen? Well, you have to get a little bit tricky and a little bit more, more IT savvy and create something called a RAID array by combining multiple hard disks into a single, what they call a logical volume. So like it would show up as a single disk, but it's really a bunch of drives underneath it. Well, what is that? I'm just going to mention what this is because I think this is more than what most people need. But that's called RAID. And RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. What does that mean? It means you take two, three, four, or more drives and you combine them together so that they operate as a single volume on your computer, a single drive. Now, you can set these up in different ways, and people have used these for uh, in, in different um different uh, configurations for different reasons. One, one reason why people would set up a, a redundant disk array is to just improve read-write performance. But you can also create arrays that, that create redundant backups. And some are hybrids. They'll do both. They'll improve disk write speed, and they will also provide a, a backup. 
Now, all of this depends on how many drives you want to put together. They need, usually need to be in, a, in an enclosure. Um, some of these enclosures will have this uh, configuration uh, ha through hardware. Other times you can do it through software. But this, this is best for protecting against drive failure. But I should completely uh, state this right up front. This is not going to back up your data. This just helps keep your disks alive while you go fix something if something were to die. So let me talk about what, what this is. Okay, the, the, there's a real simple way to, to take two disks. And what you can do is you can combine them into something called a stripe or a RAID zero. And all this does is it interleaves the two disks and it makes them run faster and it doubles the capacity. So if I have two four, four terabyte drives, I put them in a, in a stripe, and I now have an eight terabyte drive on my computer. But this is completely unsafe from a data loss standpoint. If one of those two drives were to die, the array fails. It, it can't be rebuilt, it's toast. So this is useful for things that, you know, where people want speed, you know, maybe temporary drives, you know, where, where the data on it are not critical. Not, not a good strategy for backing things up or protecting your data. The other simple array is called a mirror or a RAID 1. You have the same pair of drives, but now drive 1 or drive A and drive B are identical copies of each other. So when you write to the drive, it's writing to both drives simultaneously. What does that mean? It means if one of those drives in the pair fails, you've got your backup copy on the other drive and you can just put in a new drive and it'll rebuild itself. So you can just put in a new hard drive, rebuild it. Now, because these are an exact copy of each other, you don't gain any capacity here. So if you have two four terabyte drives, they would be combined in a RAID 1 as a single four terabyte drive, even though there's eight terabytes of, of total disk space. That's because they're a complete mirror, mirror of each other. But there's another one called RAID 5, which is what I happen to use at home. Um, and that requires four hard drives or groups of four hard drives. And it's an interesting configuration because you, get, you, you put four hard drives, say, into an enclosure. And what you get is a, a combination of interleaved performance, but also some redundancy. So if a drive dies in a RAID 5 array, if a single drive dies, I can still use it and put a new drive in and it will rebuild itself, okay? And it's faster than a RAID 1 mirror. You got to have four drives and you lose the capacity of one of them. So my current arrangement is four drives, but I have the capacity of three of them, okay? So that's a RAID 5 and it's something I do through software. So here's a, a picture of the tool that I use to build my uh, array. It's called SoftRaid, um, and it's available uh, for Mac and Windows, although the, the Windows version, I don't believe, allows for a RAID 5 configuration. You'd have to do that with a specialized hardware enclosure. But what you can see is I have a, a drive called Data, okay? And this drive called Data is, a, it is four drives together images A, B, C, and D. Each of these disks is eight terabytes in size, but you can see that even though I have 32 terabytes of disks, I can use 24 terabytes of it. So that is how I can configure this. I also have this other drive, which I just use for, for random stuff, which is an eight terabyte stripe. That's just there because it's not my primary disk. But again, these are not backup solutions, but if let's say this image is B disk in my array were to start throwing error codes and just break, I could continue to use my disk. All I need to do is go out, pick up an eight terabyte drive somewhere off the shelf and put it back into the enclosure and the system will rebuild itself. And it takes about a day. Hi, David. Um, I see your question about RAID, RAID 5 versus RAID 1 plus 0. I honestly don't know the difference between RAID 5 and 1 plus 0. Um, I'll have to go and Google that one. <laughs> so um, there's lots of different RAID configurations, but, but um, 
you have to you can google them but most of the time this is way overkill for most users this again it requires you uh, a hardware or, or software uh, tool to do it and most people aren't going to put in the overhead of buying four separate hard drives i just want to kind of make everyone aware of it but that's a good question there's there's tons of other raid array options um and you can look at the pros and cons of them um and and see which one is best for you if if that's something that you're truly interested in doing okay so the raid thing protects me against a drive dying but it doesn't back up my data so again the last strategy here is be prepared for catastrophe um and being prepared for catastrophe means simply if something terrible were to happen at your house, what is your plan? You should just have a plan. Okay. So if there's a natural disaster, a fire, an earthquake, whatever, the best strategy is to have your critical data on an external drive. I might not have room in my car to throw my computer in there, but I could certainly grab my drive enclosures and put those in the car and take them with me. The other thing is to have an offsite backup, you know, those, those disks that are stored with your backup somewhere else. And again, I think the best possible approach, if you can uh, make it work with your internet connection is to have cloud backup. Because then again, you're gonna have your data protected no, no matter where you might end up. It's not a bad idea to have a spare drive just lying around that you can use to, to, to download or recover data onto, you know, just to keep a hard drive somewhere. But that's just an optional thing. With all four of these things are stuff to think about. The most important one, of course, is to make those regular backups. Okay. So no matter how you do it, having a backup strategy is critical because you just don't want to lose your photos and everything else. Now, what about backing up Lightroom? I just want to spend a few moments with this one um, on, on this because it's a little bit different. And those of you who use Lightroom have probably seen some of these things. Um, you've got your photos versus the catalog. And then there's the Lightroom backup tools. Um, and I'll talk about some best practices as well. So Lightroom is, is really two things. Uh, there's your catalog and then there's your photos. And the two are not in the same container. So your Lightroom catalog has metadata, your image previews, but not your pictures. It's just a database. This is the file called .lrcat that you might see somewhere on your computer. That's the Lightroom database that opens when you launch Lightroom, but your photos aren't there. The only thing that the Lightroom catalog has is directory pointers to where those photos live so that I can pull the data from them when you make edits or do whatever. So your photos are separate from the catalog. And that means when you do a Lightroom backup, it backs up the database. It doesn't back up the pictures. It does not back up your pictures. So you can back up your Lightroom catalog as many times as you want. And you can create these automated routines. It'll ask you, do you want to back it up every single time you quit Lightroom once a week, once a month, whatever. Okay. It's a good practice to back up your Lightroom catalog occasionally because, you know, you don't want to lose that. But your Lightroom catalog will also get backed up um, by things like Backblaze or whatever. Now, Time Machine sometimes can have issues with Lightroom, so I don't use it to back up my Lightroom catalog. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not using Time Machine anymore for anything except my critical system files and my local, um, my local folder. Everything else gets backed up um, via alternative methods. So you can back up your Lightroom catalog, you know, your catalog settings. You can see it'll tell you when do you want to back up the catalog once a week when you exit and you'll get this up. Op it'll optimize your catalog, it'll do a bunch of things, but it's only backing up the catalog. And it says it right here. This only backs up the catalog file, not your photos. OK, so it's, it's something that you can do. Um, I, I recommend it, but you don't have to do it every single time. What happens is you get this whole folder full of Lightroom uh, backup catalogs. Now, what you can do is you can you can tell Lightroom to put that backup directory on a different disk than what is your Lightroom catalog. So let's imagine you have Lightroom on a drive and your catalogs on that drive and your backups on that drive and that drive fails. Guess what? You've lost all your backups. So if I put my Lightroom backups on a different drive, that data partitioning idea, 
then if my Lightroom disk were to fail, my backups would still be intact. So with Lightroom, just remember, you've got to back up your photos separately using one of those other uh, uh, techniques I, I described. Put your Lightroom backups on a drive that is itself backed up. Problem solved. Okay. Um, if you want to learn more, you know, you can go out to, uh, I just go to Wikipedia and you can learn about all those different raid levels. Um, there is a way to do ra simple raids in the Mac disk utility. I use a software raid called soft raid. Um, there is a windows raid. It's a little bit harder with windows. Um, so there's other, other things you can do. Like I said, I wouldn't struggle too much with, with raid. That's a lot of overkill for most people. But again, backup utilities, that carbon, copper, carbon copy cloner software, and it's now Windows 11 file restore and, and Backblaze. And um, I'm going to send everybody out an email if you're interested in trying some of these things. Um, if you want to sign up for Backblaze and you do it from the link I send you, you'll get a free month of their, of their service. And so with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, and it was a good question, and I, I was... Uh, I just saw a question in the chat box, um, whether or not I use uh, Synology and network attached storage or sometimes called NAS. No, I don't, um, but that's because I have my, my locally attached RAID array. So NAS is something called network attached storage. And that's a box that can contain one or more hard drives. And you've got them, they can even be in a, um, in a uh, RAID array, some of these boxes include RAID software that will configure your drives into one of these RAID configurations that we were talking about. Um, but the nice thing about it is that they can connect either to your computer directly or they can connect to your wireless router. And if you connect it to your router, then multiple devices can log in and connect to, the, um, to that disk. Typically, they tend to be kind of slower than direct uh, connections, but I don't have any experience using them personally. Um, there was a lot of people in the past using something called Drobo, and I think they went out of business. So I, I've talked to a lot of clients who are trying to replace drives that were originally in their Drobo array. Okay, another question is whether or not I schedule my backups through cloning software. Um, I have in the past, that's like Carbon Copy Cloner. Super Duper is a good one. That's another one. I haven't recently. That's more of a manual backup. Um, and so um, you, you um, again, it, it's something you would schedule. You'd have to connect a second drive, do the backup of the selected, whether it's everything or a selected number of, of files and folders. Um, Matt, your question is, can you set up a RAID 5 array with hard drives of different sizes and manufacturers? That's a great question. And the answer is, it depends, okay? Um, if you have a hardware RAID, away, RAID in, in other words, the RAID is configured physically in hardware, um, those drives, you want them to be typically the same size and the same manufacturer. Um, that that's a typical thing. It just wants it to be. And I had a hardware drive and a RAID array, and I got very frustrated because when I went to upgrade it, it was using a different connector uh, than than the newer boxes. Um, I had to. I went through a whole heck of a of a problem trying to copy everything over. And what I had to do was I had to build a new RAID array and then copy everything from the old one to the new one, and it was a real time consuming process. With software RAID, you can build with different any disk from anybody um, of different sizes, but you're going to be limited to the size of the smallest disk in the array. So if I had a four, a four, and two eights, the biggest I could make the array would be four by four. I couldn't use the extra capacity. Okay, so I hope that answers your, your question there. Uh, another question about can you work directly in the cloud in real time? You could do that, but I have found it to be a real problem depending on what you do. So for example, I, I had this wonderful idea that I thought at the time that I said, I will store my Lightroom catalog on my iCloud drive or on a, on a remote drive. Problem with that is that every time it would go, it would want to write the entire file, which was several, you know, 
hundreds of megabytes in size or hundreds of gigabytes in size every single time there was a change and it took forever. So you would really need to have a reliable and solid network connection for that. For me, again, I think the best solution is to work locally, but have your backups be upstairs in the cloud somewhere, because that solves all of those problems, in my opinion. Um, you know, because, you know, the, the, the other thing, too, is just remember that hard drives are relatively cheap. I was looking at the specials at B&H today in the email that I sent out and uh, that they sent me and it was like, you know, for $250 for under $300, I think you can get a 12 or even a 16 terabyte hard drive. So, I mean, you, you really can uh, do that. And, and with external enclosures, you know, you can just have extra space. Like I've got two, six terabyte drives that are just not attached to my computer that I can use if I need to do something with them. Cause they were just so inexpensive. Another good question of if there are hard drive brands that I prefer. Um, I've used a bunch of them um, and I've currently got a mixture here. Um, the best ones that I've used in the past, uh, I've, I've based these decisions on, um, so I mentioned Backblaze, which I have an account with them. And again, I will send everyone a link to that. Um, Backblaze has so many drives <laughs> in their cloud, right? They have these drive pods with, they've got thousands and thousands of hard drives. So they've got tremendous statistics on drive failures. And the bottom line is that all of them are pretty good. You know, drive failures rarely exceed an annualized rate of, you know, one or 2%. Typically, and, and this is just what I've seen, um, older Seagate drives tended to fail more. Um, but the current ones seem to be pretty good. Western Digital are good. Um, HGST, which I think got turned bought by Hitachi or something like that. Those were great if you could find them. They're hard to find. Realistically, any drive is going to be pretty good. You're probably not going to have it die immediately. You know, it's not like they're bad ones. Um, what you want to do is just have your backup strategy. So if you've got a, a, a spare drive lying around, that you can put in your computer if something were to die and you've got some kind of backup tool, you can recover your data pretty quickly and you won't be gone for too long. Where, where it really gets bad is if you, you know, if your boot drive fails. Um, one thing I didn't mention was solid state drives, SSDs. They're wonderful. And there was a question just came up here about solid state drives. I do use solid state drives. I have several of them. Um, my internal drive on my Mac is an SSD. So solid state means it doesn't have any moving parts, okay? And no moving parts means it's less prone to failure. It doesn't mean it can't fail, but it means it's far less prone to a mechanical error because, you know, spinning drive platters at 7,200 RPM and whatnot. Um, the problem with SSDs is that they are not cost-effective. They're fairly expensive. I have some portable ones from SanDisk that are on sale right now um, at at B and H, um, and I think I've got a um, a link to that in an email that that I sent out to you guys. They've got a they've got a um, that you know they're much faster. I use them to travel with. I I have a portable SSD, two terabyte or one terabyte that I can put pictures on when I'm going back and forth between my laptop and my desktop. My my Lightroom drive on my computer is actually a little SSD, so I can have them separately. And then Lightroom runs faster because it's the faster read and write speeds. Um, and my Time Machine drive that I use for local backups is also a little external SSD. Again, less prone to failure. Um, in general, your fastest drives are going to be some kind of solid state drive that has at least a USB 3 connection. And if you're lucky, if you're like on a Mac, you might get a USB 3.2 or a Thunderbolt connection. Those can be quite fast. So do I, so here's another question. Do I suggest replacing older drives, six years or more, if they're working well, are long in the tooth, um, are they more prone to fail? Absolutely more prone to fail. Now, can I say if they're going to fail? No, but you know, one thing you can do, especially with external enclosures, it's very easy. Um, you know, if you can, you know, like with uh, uh, Thunderbolt or, or some of these things where you can daisy chain uh, disc enclosures together, 
um, just buy a bigger drive, you know, replace your four terabyte drive with an eight terabyte drive or an eight with a 12 or whatever, and migrate everything over. Um, it's so inexpensive now that, um, you know, periodically you ought to take stock. But the bigger question I would think for uh, replacing drives is um, you can run diagnostics on them. Can you see if they're more likely to fail? But are your data backed up? If your data are backed up, you know, you're going to be okay. It's just a matter of do you want to be proactive now and periodically, you know, increase your capacity. The uh, question is, do drives fail due to time or use? Yes, <laughs> that's sort of both. Um, it, it's amount of hours that they're running. So the longer you run your drives, your, the, the, the more likely they are to fail. Again, failure rates tend to be annualized less than 1%, but it's non-zero. I'm not here to say, oh my God, your drives are going to you know, explode. But I have had hard drives crash. And when it happens, it can be kind of miserable. So you will feel a lot better at night if you've got a backup strategy, uh, either local or cloud-based. There's another question. Um, I guess there's some kudos to Backblaze. Yes, they've saved us. <laughs> yeah, they have. They really have. Um, is it useful to run a drive occasionally to keep it in order? I, I'm not a tech guy in that in that regard. I mean, I think it's it's not a bad idea to occasionally spin up a drive. Um, on the other hand, if you've got it sitting in cold storage somewhere, you know, I I have old drives that are just sitting in my in my basement in a box um, in storage that were you know backups from eons ago. Um, one thing that you can get, it's actually a cool little tool. Um, there is, let me go online here for a second. Um, let me just see. There's, um, there's a thing called a, uh, let me see. Closures. There used to be this thing that you could do um, where you could, it was like a little bay and you could put a hard drive into it. Yeah, it's called a, a drive dock. I'm going to share my screen here for a second. Um, can you guys see this? There's this thing called the OWC drive, drive dock. I used to have one. I, I don't have one currently. Um, mine was older. But what's really cool about this is you can just plug in a bare external drive or either three and a half inch or two and a half inch, um, including an SSD. And it just plugs in as though you're connecting it to your computer. And then this box connects via USB to just connect to a computer. So if you were going to say do an incremental backup using one of those tools like Carbon Copy Cloner or Super Duper, one of those things, and you've got like a 12 terabyte hard drive sitting around, you put it in this dock, it connects temporarily to your computer. You don't need to put it in a, an enclosure, and then you can just use that during your backup. It's really quite cool. And they're not expensive. It's um, 150 bucks um, or, or um, actually... For the most $99 would be the one that would connect most drives right here, 99 bucks. That's not bad at all. So again, that's from uh, OWC, Other World Computing. They're mostly Mac folks, but this would work, I believe, with Windows uh, machines as well. I don't see why they wouldn't. Yeah, Mac, Windows, iPad, Chrome, Linux, the whole, the whole nine yards. So very useful utility if you want to be able to do backups to... Uh, regular hard drives that aren't in their own enclosure. You know, you just buy a drive for, you know, $200 or something and then put it in this to connect them. Okay. Any other questions, group? I really do appreciate you guys spending a little of your Friday with me. It's almost, uh, the end, we made it to the end of April. Uh, you'll be getting an email from me um, briefly. Um, if you're in my email newsletter, if you've signed up for that, it's going out at the top of the hour. You should get an email from me that has the links to Backblaze, as well as some of the drive uh, specials that are going on through the end of the day. Um, like I said, I just get these emails occasionally from uh, b &H. Um, That's uh, a good one. Um, I see your comment here um, about crystal disk info. I haven't tried that one. 
I will say that my soft raid utility um, will do um, some drive uh, error detection. It can it can run some utilities. Um, many computers have built-in drive utilities. Disk Warrior was a good one. Um, there's a bunch of them out there. Um, and they can just see if a drive might be more prone to failure or not. I don't know everything about it. Like I said, I'm more of a, a photographer than an IT guy. Um, but um, before I go, let me just remind anybody, I've got one space left to join me in South Dakota for infrared workshop, infrared photo safari. Um, Badlands and and elsewhere, you can still make a deposit on that today. Um, otherwise, there's one more slot. And um, I look forward to hearing from you guys more in the future. I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks and uh, have a great weekend.